This is a work called The Long Scroll, consisting of 13 parts. This is the first part of the study, appearing on the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Please enjoy. How are you today, Sophia? I'm doing great. How are you, Dave? I am quite good and excited because The Long Scroll is the summary of years of work, and that's a subject for another time but basically it gathers together everything that I have up to this point within the lightning flash of Aleph series, as well as other books that I've written. I should also mention that the portions of the long scroll that I'll be putting up on the screen are supplemented by diagrams from my 32 keys cycle, which um, might help the points be graphically illustrated and understood. And hopefully the synergy between the two will create a pretty clear picture. So are you ready to start? Yes. Okay. This is the first page of the long scroll and it pertains to the most important concept that one must understand before anything else needs to be stated. This presents the essential nature of the ground, the ground of all phenomena, the essential basis of reality in its, in its most stripped down, irreducible form. I, I recall at the beginning of the 32 keys cycle, uh, related how an understanding of, of the ground is an understanding of the goal of the system. It's, it's part of the fundamentals and it's also realizing the ground is what we're here to do through practice. Right, and that has a twofold effect. First of all, by understanding the ground, you set out to understand the nature of reality itself. That's the first part. But the second part is that understanding of the ground or realization of that understanding is the actual fruit of the path. That's the gnosis itself. So it's both the beginning of the path and the end of the path at the same time. In this sense, the ground is like the Ouroboros serpent with its tail in its own mouth, eating itself, consuming itself, and simultaneously being reborn in every moment because if the serpent completely ate itself, it would disappear, right? And a gnosis does not make reality disappear. Right. So if you understand that, then we could go on to the big question. What is the ground? What is the essential nature of reality? In Kabbalah, we refer to it as the or and sof, the light of ensof. Or is light. En means no. Sof means limit or end. So the light without end. Now, this is greatly misinterpreted in the literature in a number of different ways. First of all, there's this negative positive dichotomy that uh, it's assumed that creation is positive and that ensof or the or of ensof, the light of ensof is somehow a negative, like a negative limitless light. That is absolutely not true, because the essential nature of the ground is neither negative or positive. Those are dualistic conceptual designations. The light of Ensof is beyond all dualistic qualifications or concepts entirely. Its basic essence is completely open, and that openness is a no-thingness. Thing means, in this context, phenomena that can be reduced to a set of defining limitations. When you have a set of defining limitations, you have a thing, whether that thing is a physical object, an energetic sensation, one of the laws of physics, an idea, whatever it is, if you can define it, it becomes contained, it becomes a thing. The ground itself is irreducible, is a no-thingness, a nothingness, a complete openness. But it is not a void. It is not a vacancy. 
It is a fullness of pure possibility that is so profoundly full that it can't even be grasped because grasping reduces it to some structure, to some limitation. So it's ungraspable. It's beyond the cognitive process of the psyche and the intellect. So this is what we refer to as the basic openness or nothingness of the ground. That is what we refer to as ensof, without end the infinite, but, and this is a big departure from what people usually think, that openness nothingness is luminous by nature. Its nature is the spontaneous expression of radiant, luminous, transparent clarity. In other words, the openness nothingness manifests itself spontaneously as a light. However, the light is not a creation of the nothingness. It doesn't depart from the nothingness. It isn't produced as a byproduct of the nothingness. In other words, the openness, nothingness of Ensof is not a creator God that said, let there be light and light was emanated from that creator God as a created thing. Because the luminosity, which is the spontaneous expression of the openness of the ground, is itself the openness of the ground. The luminosity is open, and the openness is luminous. You can't divide these two. But you can make the distinction in their study, you can intellectually understand what the aspect of luminosity is and what it does, and what the openness aspect is and what it does. But that doesn't mean that you've divided them. You can not only intellectually understand the difference between these two parts of the same thing, but you could also realize these aspects in meditation. And just because you could realize that there are these distinctions in meditation doesn't mean that you've ever divided anything. So this is why this system itself is known as a non-emanationist system, because the primary emanation, which then steps down to become every level of every world and every sphera within the 10 spherot in the worlds and souls of creation as Kabbalah generally holds, all of them are based on the primordial emanation of light from Ensof. And what I'm saying is that light never leaves Ensof, never departs from Ensof, cannot be reduced and taken out of Ensof. They are one and the same. So this right here is the fundamental point that the rest of the system pivots on. If you want to understand how the same symbol system that every other Kabbalist uses, can be understood from a non-dual, non-emanationist perspective, this is the point where you either understand it or don't understand it. You have any questions on that? Uh, I think it's just worth pointing out that uh, we're not talking about visible light. I know that might be obvious to some, but I think it's, it's worth just um, you mentioning again that even, even the term light is itself metaphor. Uh, for this perfect continuum that is neither a thing or not a thing. It's something beyond the two of them. And we have to use uh, this twilight symbol language to point these things out because as soon as we try and concretize something into a hard symbol, it, it is this, we're right back in emanationist territory, which is exactly what you're trying to get away from with your system here. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you're absolutely correct that we are not talking about not only visible light, but we're not talking about any kind of phenomena whatsoever. We're talking about luminosity. We're using the term luminosity as a metaphor for all of the possible modes of expression that include visible light, but also include sound and include thought and awareness. 
and perceptibility and the capacity for this luminous assertion of the fullness of the ground to concretize as physical objects or the laws of nature or the types of movement and the qualities of things that can be apprehended. So the sum total of all of those qualities and types of expression that include every part of the uh, perceivable spectrum, all of them fall under the general symbol of luminosity, the luminosity of Ensof. Ensof itself becomes luminous in order to express its fullness, the fullness of its open-ended possibility. And that open-ended possibility never departs from any instance. So even the most coarse and dense so-called physical object is only an expression of Ensof, has never stepped down from Ensof, and is essentially Ensof exclusively for those with eyes to see it. And that is, of course, the difference between somebody who contemplates the essential nature of reality and holds all things to be divine from the ordinary modes of perception, which believes that not only are things what they appear to be, but they're all separate from each other. There's no unifying or connecting continuum whatsoever. And we live in a chaotic random universe which is essentially the nihilistic, materialistic view of um, secular culture. Yeah. Now, what I, now, what I'm saying also, since it doesn't hold a theistic creator God, I'm not falling back on a religious view either. So what I'm saying is actually neither religious nor secular. Right. It's a radical mystical view that has always been present but is very rarely talked about because for the most part throughout history, um, you get it from both ends. You know, there were times when the church would kill you for saying these things. And now in a university driven culture that's dominated by the laws of academia, you get killed in other ways by saying these things, Kill, killed by cancellation, you could say. Yeah, the, the true view of non-dualism is, um never very popular throughout history. <laughs> There's always somebody willing to uh, attack it and tear it down. And I'd also like to say that uh, Ein Sof, Ein Sof is uh, imperceptible, but it's responsible for everything that is perceptible. It's um, the, the perceptible is still Ein Sof. Well, that's a very good lead in to the next point. The next point, um, first of all, we should say that the sum total of the continuum of the openness that expresses itself through luminosity is a pure fullness of possibility, but that possibility is carried into every detail of life, right? That's a continuum. That's a complete continuum. And there's a name for this continuum that I sometimes use. It's called the plenum, which is both open and completely full, but in its fullness, it has the capacity to bestow that fullness of possibility and bestow that tendency to express itself into opportunities of expression, which are always spontaneous, constantly changing, constantly adjusting and elaborating and so on and so forth. So when I refer to the plenum, I'm talking about both the openness, nothingness, and its capacity for spontaneous expression into luminosity. That's the ground in the, in the widest possible definition. So getting back to what you just said, there are two symbols that are commonly used the way I speak about them and in other symbol systems to talk about how the plenum lends itself to the possibilities of phenomena. And these two symbols are the sun and the moon. But unlike the common or popular way of understanding these symbols, the gender associations are reversed. Usually the moon is a symbol of the female and the sun is the symbol of the male. 
Here, I'm using them in the exact opposite way. That the openness of pure, full, absolute possibility is like the radiance of the sun, which gives its light, but it gives its light from nowhere. The light is itself nothingness, but nothingness that has become bright in the giving, bright in the bestowing of its possibilizing capacity. That's the symbol of the sun here. When that possibility is given to all circumstances and scenarios that could possibly arise, what carries the the lucent openness of Ensof into the fullness of its expression is what we call the moon. So the sun is just the basic fullness of open possibility, but the moon carries that possibility. The moon is the possibilizing capacity that is drawn into action. So the sun is purely open, but open with a fullness, and the moon is the carrier, the carrier of that, that capacity to expression or that trajectory towards expression that is inherent in anything that arises. And together, you can't really have one without the other. And this is really the important point about these two symbols. They're not two. They're the same thing seen from opposite vantage points, we could say, because certainly the sun is inherent in the moon because the moon is only carrying that possibility. And certainly the capacity to be carried is inherent in the expression of the luminosity itself. So the sun and the moon become the basis of all the oscillating interactive patterns that weave together phenomena in which we either realize the essential ground of Ensof or fail to do so. Making sense so far? Yeah, yeah. And it, it may be helpful to use the, uh, the more gross symbolism of the actual sun and moon in, in the sense that when it's nighttime and you see the moon, you're only seeing it because it's reflecting the sun's light, but you can't see the sun because it's nighttime. And I, that, that seems to me the, the way that this is operating here is that when you're perceiving appearance, uh, you're not perceiving the end soft directly. You're only perceiving the, the moon's capacity to reflect it, symbolically speaking. But it's like you just said, the, the sun is inherent in it. So there is no real separation. It's just a, a symbolic uh, tool for understanding how, how the ground functions and displays itself. Yes, and this brings up an interesting question about the reflection language as a symbol, because from the perspective of human habit patterns, we believe in things. The human habit is to believe in a world of separate things. The view that I'm asserting here is going against the very basis of human habitu habituation, where I'm asserting that there are no things. Things appear, but they are not what they seem to be. They are actually open in nature, except that openness is beyond the coarse habits of fixation that the human mind asserts on whatever it finds. All its phenomena is relegated to a grasped thing that seems separate from everything else and seems solid and real and tangible. When that solidity or that tendency for grasping through practice and contemplation, when it starts to open up back into its essential nature, the world doesn't go away. It just changes its meaning. It opens from the inside out. And that actually changes the reflection language of the sun and the moon. Because if you view the moon as the vehicle to assert points of resistance, which make reflections, then you have a pretty good understanding of the moon's capacity for making things seem the way that they seem to be. But that reflection 
is tempered by contemplation. And at a certain point, we have to throw it out entirely. It seems as though there's a point of reflection, like a hard stop where incoming light hits a point of resistance and then travels back in reflection. It seems like that is happening, but actually every point, the incoming and the outgoing light, the point of reflection itself, it's all open. So at a certain point, we have to use the reflection language of the sun and the moon, and then we have to throw it out entirely. Because ultimately, and this is, this is the part which gets very confusing for people in a, a gender sense, <laughs> ultimately the moon has to defer back to the sun. Mm -hmm. And I shudder to think what feminists will make of that. Oh, let's not bring them into the conversation. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I, I'd also like, like to point out that um, this notion of reflection to me seems synonymous with limitation. Right. It's the, it's the same thing. Like if you're having a, a so-called reflection, you're having the appearance of a limitation, which is just appearance itself. I mean, the fact that we think that there are separate objects and that there, there's something to be conceived of uh, it necessitates a limitation put upon the limitless. And the goal of contemplation is, like you said, to it doesn't make the world and the appearance of, of limitation disappear. It just, you, you just are, are forced to realize that uh, it's still limitless. It just appears otherwise. Yeah, that's the really difficult thing about this view because I'm not denying reflections and I'm not even denying limitations. I'm just asserting pretty much what you just said. I'm saying the limitations that appear and they do appear those limitations are themselves limitless. And that's the paradox. The paradox is that you could have the finite and at the same time understand its infinite nature. It doesn't deny the finite. So I'm not denying the world. I'm not a world denialist. I am not a phenomena denialist. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, this is not a transcendental system that mm -hmm. seeks to transcend the mundane appearances and sweep them under the rug somehow. I'm trying to understand the very phenomena that everyone perceives that appears on a far deeper, more essential level. So nothing has to be taken out. Nothing needs to be added. The essential nature is already always the case. If we could actually seek to understand it, and realize it through our contemplation. So move on to the next point, because you obviously understood that. When we make the distinction intellectually or in terms of contemplative realization, we can understand that this openness, nothingness aspect is what we call en sof, the ground of realization. And the aspect of luminosity is its light, its or. However, like I said, the tendency in Kabbalah is to separate those two things as if the or, the light, was emanated from and so right? Even the emanationists who do that see the light as the means to realize the ground because the or goes on to perform throughout the worlds and, and it becomes shaped into, into the phenomena of worlds and souls. The difference is that the emanationists see that or see that light is something that has uh, uh, been produced like a byproduct from Ensof and has stepped down from Ensof to then go out and perform. And I'm saying that no such departure has ever taken place. That is a huge distinction. And that actually breaks apart the whole emanationist argument. The, the miracle of it is that we're, we can still use the same symbol system as the emanationists. We could still speak the same language of spherot and qualities of the soul and worlds and talk about primary alchemical symbols like the sun and the moon and sulfur and mercury, which we'll get to in a second. We could use all the same symbols that the emanationists use. We are just changing the meaning to a unicity, to a continuum we are deferring back to the ground where the sun and the moon are not separate from each other. That's the important point. So in practice, 
if we could understand or realize the nature of the openness, nothingness we're calling in. So we have the essential solvent for reification. Reification is just the limitation, the limitational tendency that the mind asserts as a habit. And everything that the mind that is beholden to this habit perceives then becomes a grasped, limited thing or object in an object field. So no matter what world you're talking about, no matter what array of qualities you're referring to, if you have the habit of reification, you are perceiving a habit field. Turning off my phone here. And a habit field or the habit field, the way that I use the term, is what we could call the conventional version of reality or the ordinarily perceived commonly shared conception of reality that is divided into random pieces whose motion and influence and tendencies are studied in the laws of physics, right? Physicists are essentially trying to reduce the tendencies of things to, to laws that can then be grasped and understood. It is a reductionist mentality, right? Even quantum physics, even the most open-ended register of physics will always be terminally incomplete because they're trying to reduce it further and further and further. They'll never find the end because the end is end so So physics will work from the standpoint of, of a materialist trying to understand their habit field, but it will never work in a mystical sense, trying to reach the essential nature of reality, which is ungraspable. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to, to point out to uh, something really interesting that you once said to me when I asked, what is a human being? And your response was a collection of habits, which just sort of shocked me to my core, because if you just if you take that to its logical conclusion, the the sense that you are a human and there's a world and there's a sky and a ground and you have five senses, all of those are just assumptions. There are there assumptions about what reality is and, and thus that's what you get. And you keep reincarnating as a human because you assume you're a human and so on and so forth. And that just really sort of, um, I, just, I just wanted to point that out there because I think it's, it's fundamental and it ties in with your uh, your use your fluid use of symbols right that that even the symbols themselves are not these hard and fast rules like the physicists and the the physical scientists uh, would use to figure out reality from the outside in they're um, they're tools they're useful tools and methods that we use as thinking conscious beings who you know with a set of assumptions and habits about the world to unmake what it is we think we know to unmake these habits and that's that's another way of describing the path yeah the, a very good point sophia so really you have two components to this what is a human being question answer human being is a collection of habits right there's two parts to that habit structure there is a subject the self-identification of knowing this as me, there is knowing who is knowing, oh, it must be me. What is known, whatever I perceive. That's the object. So you have the subject, which is the reification of the knower. And then you have the reification of the object of that knowing, which becomes the object of perception, which ironically could be the subject itself, my own identity. I could, the subject could think of their, their own identity as an object, right? So there's always in the dualistic habits, a subject and an object. But if you, if you spin that out to a larger context, the, the object becomes objectivity itself. The idea that the world of perceivable objects is real and separate from me. 
right? In all the worlds and all the registers, galaxies, star systems, whatever, however far you want to take it, that is objective reality to a materialist. What perceives it is the subjectivity of my knowing it. So the subject and object become dimensions of subjectivity and objectivity, which are always opposed to each other until they're resolved in the end, right? Until that point of resolution is even considered, subjectivity and objectivity will never meet. But the ironic part is that they're touching all the time, right? Because you can't know that there is an objective universe unless you're subjectively perceiving it. What about the point in where they touch? That's all we're interested in here. So taking that back to the notes here, there's this weird idea in Hermetic Kabbalah, which sees Ensof as pure potentiality, maybe, but then it emanates its light, right? And they could even take it one step further. They could say there is a nothingness, N, there is nothingness without N, Ensof. And then there is the light of that nothingness without end, and so forth. Or I've seen this division. It's actually similar to a kind of a threefold division of the ground that I use that I'll get to later on. But it always defers back to this emanationist idea that Enso produced or created or spit out its light somehow. And why is that? Well, look at the notes here, and this is the reason why. Because if we understand that Ensof is the ground of realization or the ultimate source of everything, the light that is expressed becomes the means to both the act of knowing and whatever is known. The act of knowing can be calibrated Kabbalistically in terms of the levels of the soul or the levels of consciousness. And the realms of what is known become the worlds, the registers of known things. So it seems from a conventional standpoint that everything that is known and all the knowing that goes into knowing it, right, the levels of the soul and the worlds, come from a source, a source that must be far away. And if you say that that source that is far away functions in, in the ancient or medieval sense as a creator God, then of course, what is created is all this. So creator and creation form this dualistic dichotomy. If you defer to the view that I'm asserting here, we are saying that all the modes of knowing and all the registers of phenomena that can be known are one luminous expression, which is not separate from, literally, not separate, not dual, non-dual, is a non-dual spontaneous expression of a fullness without end. And nothing has departed from anything else. Just because it seems that it is, doesn't mean that it somehow came out of what is not. So what I'm asserting here is a view that is beyond is and is not yes and no, negative and positive, by putting the two together, the ensof or, or what I call the or ensof, which is really how it's said, uh, you know, in Kabbalah, the or ensof, the light of ensof, as one continuum, that is the ground, that is the wisdom of reality. And when one understands its nature, one understands the wisdom nature of reality, and that's the definition of gnosis. Any questions or points before I go on to the next part? I think that uh, not so far. That sums it up nicely. Yeah, there is no is and is not. Those, those are conceptual designations and, and anything, anything that asserts that there is a yes or a no, it just comes right back into dualism and I, I think this this was a real hump for me to get over realizing that even your thoughts and feelings and any sort of 
uh, designation of subtle versus gross matter, like you're still in dualistic territory. Like this is something that is completely beyond the, the ordinary mind's ability. This is beyond psychology. It's beyond any sort of um, perceptibility whatsoever. And that, I think that's the thing, that's the sort of dis difficult thing to come around to here is that, and, and this is why it's so hard to talk about, is that we are literally discussing something that cannot be discussed and cannot be conceptualized, period. And yet we're trying to talk about it. And uh, you know, that's why we keep falling back on, these, on this netty netty designation, right? It's not this, it's not that. Right. That's well, all we yeah, um, what you're saying, I need to introduce a concept here. Just because um, what we're saying is beyond human understanding doesn't mean that we can't form some intellectual basis for the inquiry, which is right. what we're doing. So what I'm proposing here will not work as a philosophy because a philosophy is just a set of conceptual designations that one intellectualizes about. That won't get you anywhere. It won't get you to realize the essential nature of what I'm talking about. But it's pretty impossible to start the path of contemplation, which seeks the realization of the essential nature of the ground. It's pretty impossible to do that without first having some intellectual foothold as a starting point. You have to know what you're trying to realize. So it won't work as philosophy, but forming a philosophical understanding of these concepts is a starting point. It is the necessary starting point for the inquiry. It won't do the job, but the job can't be done without it. Right, yeah, and this, uh, this is the cataphatic versus apophatic um, method, right? Like exactly. We because we're thinking and conceptualizing beings, uh, you know, rather than try and um, forcibly deny our nature as such we're instead using our our conceptualizing capacity as a springboard as this basis for something else because we can't help ourselves we're going to conceptualize we're going to think the mind is going to think so we may as well use that as this as this starting point like you said to then go to the apophatic the next the next process in the uh, in the method I am very glad that you said that because, yes, the cataphatic process doesn't only involve intellectual understanding, but a lot of feeling tones that are cultivated as sensations in contemplation, energetic sensations in contemplation that build as we raise life force to greater and greater um, peaks of expression as we coax it out of the, the, the dull mediocrity of ordinary life, which is mostly habitual, it's mostly robotic behavior, automatic behavior. As we wake up, the life force rises. And as we uh, cultivate that life force into greater degrees of subtlety, we have experiences along the way that are sort of indicators that there's an actual process that's going on. It's not the same as gnosis. It's the path that leads to gnosis. These are the, the experiential or cataphatic aspects of the contemplative path on the way to the great apophatic immersion into nothingness. And probably towards the third or fourth section of this long scroll, I'll start talking exclusively about in detail about how the apophatic process works, that being the whole point of the whole thing. But right now, let's make a point about Keter. Keter, the crown of the tree of life, the head sphera of the 10 spherot. Every occultist knows of the 10 spherot, right? It's at the point of Keter that meaning truly changes for all the rest of the spherot. In other words, if all the 10 spherot function simultaneously all the time, 
What we do with them, what we're aware of and what we're not aware of is another question, but they're always functioning. They don't need to be activated. They're already active by virtue of the fact that there's reality because reality is just the tense we wrote in play. But when the view that I'm talking about is realized or understood, it changes the meaning of how the ten spherot function. And the text, Fountain of Wisdom, this is my root text, calls this point of Keter a door that opens or closes. If the door is closed, the spherot all contribute to a conventional understanding of the habit field. And it could be studied and one can live one's life, no problem. But if you open that door, you open the door essentially to what would be the apophatic immersion, and then the understanding of what is beyond Keter in the or and Sof, the ground of phenomena, pours through that open door, and that changes the meaning of the spherot unrecognizably. So the view of the wisdom nature of reality is either made and realized at Keter, or shut off and, uh, and obstructed completely at Keter. In other words, we either make an ordinary reality at that point or unmake those habit tendencies at that point so something far deeper can happen. Now, Keter is, um, the, is seen in anthropomorphic symbolism in Kabbalah, uh, especially by the Lurianic schools, which sum up the interaction of the, the patterns of the sphero through the worlds as uh, anthropomorphic patterns called partsufim, right? With heads and arms and torsos and legs and whatnot. And Keter is seen as the skull that contains two hemispheres of the brain called the mohin. And essentially what Keter contains are the spherot of Chokmah and Bina, which are functions or expressions of light, functions or expressions of the Orensof as it pours forth in the expression of things. From the wisdom point of view, the light of the Mohin is completely non-dual. In other words, it can't be reduced to one of the dualistic tendencies that light is assumed to have in the ordinary habit field. And those two tendencies are light as illumination and darkness, which is its opposite. So the true understanding of Chokmah and Bina, and this is what is realized in contemplation once the breakthrough out of the world of psychological grasped meanings is explored. Once there is immersion into the essential nature of things, this is what is actually realized. That Bina is understood as a brilliance that is so bright that it is dark, a dark brilliance. And Chokmah is its nature, which is a brilliance so bright that it is dark, a brilliant darkness. So we have a dark brilliance seen from the standpoint of what we could say outgoing and brilliant darkness, which is its nature, which is incoming. Right. So it's essentially what we're talking about here is the exchange between the sun and the moon on a secret level, on a non dual level, the highest possible level in which we could consider polarities or dualistic exchanges can only be understood once it's understood that their interaction is non dual. So if you understand that the interaction is non dual, then you could address the seemingly dualistic exchange and understand it beyond duality, right? And that's what is done in the depth of light itself. In other words, if you, if you didn't have this understanding, terms like brilliance and radiance and even luminosity would, would only be understood as a positive assertion contrasted to some negative, which was its opposite. What's understood at the level of Chokmah and Bina is the, the deepest possible expression that is understood at Keter, and that is an understanding of light itself beyond dualistic extremes. 
Making sense so far? Yeah, yeah. The, the way I, I tend to think about um, the interplay between Bina and Hakma is that Bina be, uh, can be seen as, this, as contextuality per se that is pregnant with Hakma, which is motion, and that you can't really have one without the other because if you've got a context, there's something in the context, it's contextualizing something. And if you've got motion, it needs a context in which to move. So it's this perfect interplay of these two symbols that uh, can never be separate from each other. But if you had to dualize them somehow, this is what you could say about them. I would like to rehabilitate your language of, uh, at a few words that you've used. Instead of calling Hawkma motion, I would rather call it pure dynamism. Pure dynamism, okay. Right, because motion is perceived in the middle six sphero. As a matter of fact, when we call Bina basic space, we are talking about a space that is non-spatial. It's only functioning as what we call space, meaning three-dimensionally, once you have designation points that have height and depth and width, right? Once you have the six spherot of the Ruach creating what we call the cube of space, you could calibrate motion in any direction. So what is the basis of that openness? What is the basis of space, which is beyond the calibration of motion, which is a, a, a thought designation, which is a perceptual designation, right? What we have is an aspect of space, which is purely open, but open in a way that is non-spatial from the standpoint of the psyche. It's utterly different than what we think of as the vastness of space. From the perspective of the human habit field, we think of space like Star Trek. The Star Trek Enterprise is going and going and going and going and, you know, forever. That is a psychologically based conception of space. The basic space of Bina is a dark brilliance, which is completely open, but has no dimensionality to it whatsoever. It's only when the inherent dynamism of Chokmah that is replete within that space starts to designate points that you get motion and you get space in the sense that the psyche can attach to it and, and note its depth or dimensionality. So on the level of Chokmah and Bina, since Chokmah and Bina are replete within each other, the dynamism is inherent in the openness, and the openness is inherent within the dynamism, just like we started out saying with openness and, and the luminosity, right? So the same is true with Bina and Chokmah on the level below Keter in the system, where the light is actually reconciled. On the level of the plenum, we can't even say that the luminosity that we're talking about is a light, like a graspable light. On the level of the plenum, on the level of the ground, when we talk about the luminosity, what we're talking about is a tendency towards divulgence. It's a tendency towards dynamism, but you can't reduce it to an energy. You can't reduce it to a dynamic impulse that the mind grasps. It's not separate from that, right? Whatever the mind grasps as dynamic energy or motion is inherently just that. But on the purest possible level, it's just this thrust open-endedly into, um, into a dynamic without any designation points, without any stoppage points beyond qualities other than the surge itself. So this is why we don't call Chokmah motion, although it's inherent in motion, it's the primal ingredient of motion. It is pure dynamism, just like Bina is pure space or basic space or pure openness. So it's essentially nothingness and luminosity on the level of beginning the, the discussion of what can then be asserted. Mm -hmm. so, Asserting what appears. Right. So we could say 
that on the level beyond Keter, we have the sun and the moon as tendencies of pure potential. On the level below Keter, which is Chokma and Bina, we have the sun and the moon one step closer to what the mind can recognize as its actual state in terms of its actual circumstance. I shouldn't say actual state, because the actual state is the openness and luminosity of, of Or and Sof. But the circumstance, once that we actually engage in contemplation, that we discover that essential nature within, that involves qualities of dark brilliance and brilliant darkness, which are discovered in contemplation meditatively. And when you discover them, you discover that they're not separable from each other, but you can make the distinction. Just because you can understand the distinction intellectually or um, feel out the distinction contemplatively doesn't mean you can ever divide the two. They're in constant union. So up until the point of Chokmah and Bina, the sun and moon are in absolute union, are a total unicity. It's only below that point, below dot into the Ruach, where we think that they act as separate forces. And those separate forces are really the forces that draw life force from heat and pressure. And we call that sulfur. That's the energetic expression of the sun and the carrying of luminosity into different states through a fluid adaptation of its function. We call that mercury. That's the lower functional arc of the moon. So we have these tendencies of openness and luminosity, ensof and its light, although they are inseparable. And these become the models for dualistic interactions that are given the designation of the sun and the moon once they start functioning in the Ruach and in our circumstance, they become the forces of sulfur and mercury. Make sense so far? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so dot is sort of this, this um, divine line between uh, what appears with conceptual designations and that which is beyond conceptuality. Dot is the point of departure where either conceptual designations are either offered up to be unmade at Keter or they fail to do so and are held onto as the standard for ordinary life. Dot is the point where we either decide to go beyond our habits or retain and become addicted to our habits, essentially. Okay, yeah, this, uh, this reminds me of that whole melodramatic retelling of this this notion of crossing the abyss right like <laughs> you're you reach the the point of dot and you're either you're just going to go totally mad or you're going to connect with the holy garden angel and that seems like a, a very dogmatic religious story version of what these symbols are actually trying to communicate, which is uh, much more subtle and, and personal. Well, I, I'm glad that you threw that in there because I've got a lot of people who are going to be listening to this who are coming from that perspective and that system. And the reason I don't like that language, it's not fundamentally wrong. You could actually use those exact words and those exact symbols to make the points that I'm making. But the reason why I tend not to do that and don't like it is because it dualizes the two. If you've got a threshold to cross or an abyss to fall through, then you've separated what's on one side of the abyss from what's on the other side of the abyss. And if you create that separation, then you don't understand that the or and sof is this here now. It's not something else. You don't have to cross a threshold. There is no threshold. The threshold is your habit field. The right. threshold is the liminal line in which your habits are either imprisoning you or you find the means to mitigate that that resistance and realize what things actually always were 
in this very moment. There's nowhere to go. There's no abyss to cross. There's no threshold. That's a myth asserted by the habits themselves to keep themselves in business. Yeah, they're tricky like that. Tricky little bastards. 